Thanks very much, and thanks guys for coming out. Thanks for having me here. This is my second night in Austin, my second user group. I've got uh, two more to go in Houston after this, so I've still got a little energy left. I'm not quite uh, beaten down and worn out yet. Um, so let's get started here. Uh, this is this next slide is kind of for my benefit, just to make sure I know where I am. Austin Node.js user group. And I didn't know the Twitter, uh, otherwise I would have put that on the slide too. Um, so if you're not familiar, go to the meetup address there and uh, check them out, especially those of you watching at home. Uh, I am Matthew Groves. I work for Couchbase as a developer advocate. Can you guys sit back here me okay over there? Okay, great. Um, I have a Twitter account. I run a podcast and a blog. If you, and you guys want to be on my podcast, talk about some interesting technology for 10 to 15 minutes, please let me know. Go to that site and check it out. I'd love to have you on the show. And uh, I'm not an expert. I want you guys to know that right up front here on anything, really, uh, especially if you ask my wife. Uh, but uh, I am very enthusiastic about technology. I like talking about it. I like learning about it. I like telling people about it. So if you've got questions, and if it's a really broad question, I may say, you know, let's talk about it afterwards. Or I may not know. I can find out for you. But please, feel free to raise your hand and stop me at any time to ask questions. And I'll do my best to, uh, to help you out there. This question always comes up, so I thought I'd just make a slide for it and get it out of the way. You've probably heard of CouchDB before. CouchBase and CouchDB are not the same thing. They share an acronym, and they're both NoSQL databases. Other than that, they are not the same piece of software. It's not a fork of one another. We're not the CouchBase or the CouchDB company, anything like that. CouchDB is Apache Foundation, and CouchBase is CouchBase Incorporated. So just want to get that out of the way there. If you guys want a you know, Twitter account and you want to tweet something tonight, a picture, if you use hashtag Couchbase so my boss knows I'm not just down here screwing around, I'd appreciate that. And I brought some stickers, although last night they took more stickers than I expected, so I have a, only a few left. But if, you've got, if you want a sticker, I've got one. You can put it on your nice, pristine laptop and, uh, you know, defile it if you want to. All right, so full stack development with no JS and no SQL. That is a lot of buzzwords. And, you know, as a developer advocate, I, I got to use buzzwords, but also as a, you know, a developer, sometimes they make me uncomfortable, like when the, the term full stack. Sometimes people scoff at that and they say, well, you're not writing, you know, drivers, you're not writing uh, operating systems, you're not really writing the full stack, right? Well, the full stack, we really mean the application stack, right? The, you know, the UI, the database, uh, you know, maybe some uh, Docker scripts and deployment code, things like that, some DevOps stuff, but we're not, we're not with the full stack, it's just the application stack. And the other one up there is NoSQL. And I work for a company that is a NoSQL database company, but I don't really like the term NoSQL because it describes what something isn't, and that's only useful for a little while, right? Um, so, and, and as you'll see later, there is a lot of SQL in our NoSQL. So, um, just want you to know that those buzzwords are up there to make this title a little shorter and zippy and more appealing. This is the more accurate, um, much harder to say title, and usually too long to fit into the max length of those text boxes. <sighs> so, um, full stack developer. Who here considers themselves a full stack developer? You know, if you're someone who's sort of right in this middle area here, you're working on the, on the UI, the back end, uh, the database, maybe some DevOps scripting, a mobile app perhaps, or a mobile website. If you're somewhere near this middle here, I, I think you're a full stack developer, for sure. And, you know, probably some of you are and you just don't realize it yet. Um, so when we're talking about application stacks, this is sort of the traditional stack, the LAMP stack on the left here. Very server heavy. Um, you know, this could be, this, the P here is sometimes PHP, sometimes Python, maybe even Perl if you're a real sadist, I guess. Um, but that's sort of traditional stack. And you know, we could also do Microsoft technologies here. The same sort of stack applies. It's that, it's that traditional web stack, the LAMP stack. The, the more modern stack is what a lot of you guys are probably using already, which is like a mean stack. Um, you know, typically have a, like Mongo as a, a database up there for NoSQL, Express Angular Node, and um, that's, you know, there's a different kind of separation there because now we have the UI, it's all in the browser for the most part, making requests to a back end with REST endpoints. And that's 
the sort of full stack that I'll be talking about today. But why NoSQL for those mean uh, stacks? Well, if we look at a traditional relational database uh, and our, our mean architecture, we're often returning like a JSON document from those endpoints. And to build that document, we have to join, you know, in this case, three tables, but sometimes four or five more tables to create that JSON document. So the thought is, why not just store this JSON document in the database and return that directly and not go through all this rigmarole here? So that's why you'll often see NoSQL databases used in that mean type of stack. Now, you don't have to use NoSQL to do that. You could go through this kind of stuff if you, if you want to or you need to. But that's why NoSQL appeals to a lot of these full stack architectures. NoSQL is not a silver bullet, will not solve all your problems. And sometimes it's not the right answer. Uh, sometimes SQL is the right answer, or sometimes SQL and NoSQL is the right answer. So these are some sort of uh, rules of thumb about where you might want to consider NoSQL versus traditional relational data. And, um, you know, something to think about. Uh, it, there's no best practice I'm recommending here. You know, the only best practice I'm going to recommend is to just, you know, use your brain and, and think about uh, which one is going to work for you and your use cases. We have uh, some white papers, if I can get this to go here, uh, accountspace.com that go over some use cases, some real use cases that our customers have gone through and why they're using NoSQL uh, in addition to relational or instead of relational and what they're doing with them. So if you're interested in those you know, deeper dives into the use cases, that's a good place to go and check out a free white paper there, couchbase.com. Is there a question back there? These foils are available so I don't have to take pictures of your screen. Um, I can make them available, yes, the slides, sure, sure, I can do that. Um, I'll give you my Twitter account, just look for, I'll tweet out the link there or something um, later on, so that'll be there for you. Or I'll send it to uh, Oro or somebody and uh, he can get it to you. So uh, often uh, in this list you'll see like AOL, PayPal, Tesco, some more uh, big companies that uh, let us use them in our white paper, so that's pretty cool. So I'm going to talk about, not Mongo today, but Couchbase, which is a, a document database, kind of in the same space as Mongo. Some things that make it a little uh, different, a little cool, cooler, I think, is that Couchbase has a built-in managed cache layer. So oftentimes, you're going to be interacting with documents in RAM, reading and writing, instead of having to wait to go to disk. So that cache is just part of Couchbase. You don't have to set it up or configure it. It just comes with it. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Couchbase can act as a, as a basic key value store. So you don't have to necessarily store JSON documents. You can store other stuff if you want to. But you're going to get more power if you use it as a document database because now the server can do some server-side stuff because it knows that you have JSON in there. We have some mobile stuff too. I'll briefly touch on that at the end. We don't have a lot of time to talk about that today. So, um, you know, we, we serve some, uh, we, we kind of look for agility and scalability uh, in, our, uh, in Couchbase, and these are some of, the, some of the things we offer. I've talked about a lot of these already, uh, mobile down there. And scaling, so Couchbase, like a lot of NoSQL databases, it can horizontally scale. It can also vertically scale. We have what's called multi-dimensional scaling available. But you can just rack up additional servers to add to your capacity, maybe a busy time of the year, a busy time of the day. You can rack up more servers and then reduce them when you want to save costs. You don't need as, as many. Multi-data center is a pretty cool feature of Couchbase. Um, you can set up a data center on the west coast and on the east coast, or the north and the south, or whatever, and you can sync between those different data centers. And that's built into Couchbase. That's a pretty cool feature. A lot of our customers really like that one. I'm going to talk about uh, Node and JavaScript tonight. But uh, if you use other languages, uh, Microsoft, uh, you know, .NET, or Java, or PHP, or whatever, Python, we have SDKs available for all those out there. I'm going to talk about um, Express tonight as the framework with Node. But certainly, if you, you wanted to use um, uh, what's on, what's on, uh, Sales, for instance, you could use that instead, or uh, Happy, if anyone's familiar with that one, H-A-P-I. Those all work fine with, with Couchbase SDK. I'm also and maybe this will lose me some cred here. I'm using Windows tonight. Um, 
with Node and also Couchbase runs on Windows, but it also runs on, on Mac and Linux just fine. Uh, also, you can deploy it to Docker or to Amazon or uh, Azure. Those, are all, those all work fine with Couchbase. Uh, anybody in here into big data or big analytics, things like that? A couple of you over here, okay. You got some questions? Or? I have a question. Sure. Um, I see you have a MacBook. Why, why are you why are running on Windows? I'm curious on that. Um, it's complicated is, is the answer. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Microsoft guy. Most of my career is Microsoft stuff. Um, I, when I started working at Couchbase, they didn't tell me they were going to send me a MacBook. It just showed up in the mail one day. <laughs> so I said, all right, I'll use, I'll use this MacBook. It, it's nice. It's a nice piece of hardware. So hey, if you're handing them out, I'll use it. Was there another question somewhere? Or just someone raising their hands for big data? Big data, all right. So um, just a couple of you, I'm sort of touch on it briefly, but we have some uh, integrations available for some big data tools, uh, Spark and uh, Kafka. Um, those are available, I think we've, we actually support those and some other ones. These are all that different tools that our customers are using or are trying out with, with Couchbase. So those are all available for you. I mentioned already the Couchbase uh, scaling architecture. You can create a bunch of nodes to create a cluster. Now Couchbase is, somewhat unique in that each node in the cluster is of equal importance. So there's not like a master slave or primary secondary type situation there. Uh, each node is as equally important in the cluster as any other node. And the data is spread out automatically sharded between each of those nodes. So you don't have to set up any sort of sharding scheme or anything like that when you are reading and writing documents. Um, as a developer, you're going to be interacting with the cluster manager here, which handles all the um, sort of the um, configuration, the heartbeat, statistics, and uh, even provides a RESTful um, management interface for you. And then um, these services up here, data query and index, you can um, choose to install those on each node or on individual nodes, and that's where you can, that multi-dimensional scaling comes into play. Like maybe you want a really fast processor for query, and the rest of the nodes can just be for, you know, commodity servers for storage. Here's a screenshot of the admin console. So when you install Couchbase Server, you'll be able to go to this in a web browser. You can manage your clusters, look at the status of your nodes, how many operations are happening. You can look at individual documents, run queries, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, so you said that every node is of equal importance. Yes. So the question was, in failsafe, what does that mean? So you're asking, like, if a node goes down, what does that mean? So um, when a node goes down in Couchbase, the documents on there can no longer be written to, obviously. Um, the replicas of those documents can live on other nodes, so you can still read those uh, in, you know, while that node is down. And then if you, if you set up auto failover, which typically you'd probably want to, when a node is found to be down, the cluster will rebalance and promote those uh, replicas to active documents. So you can start reading and writing from them. There is an auto failover option, yes. Yeah. It's not turned on by default because we want you to sort of be aware that you're opting into that. But most of the time you want to opt into that, for sure. Yeah, question over there. Um, so with rebalancing, what does it mean in terms of storage? I mean, that probably does have some effect because when you, when you want to store replicas, you can choose to store you know, like one, two, or three replicas across your cluster. So, um, but th those I don't think are, they, they might be, I might be wrong about this, they might be typically just stored in disk though, not so much in RAM, unless you're you know, trying to get those, um, those read-only copies out in some emergency situation. So I think it would just maybe affect your, the disk space you'd, you'd want to use. Maybe you want to bump it up a little higher than normal. Uh, but I don't think it will affect the, term, the amount of RAM you need to use for those. That doesn't really answer your question specifically, but um, if you're looking for specific guidance, we can talk about that later. Sure. Okay. All right. I mentioned the REST API. This is a really good tool for managing, uh, writing automations, and, and so on. So it's a full feature REST API. This is just, you know, part of it. There's a whole list of endpoints here. 
if you want to manage your clusters and your buckets and um, your uh, areas and things like that, you can use the REST API. Okay, so now we've got Couchbase installed, Couchbase server installed. We've got maybe a bucket we've created. As a developer, we need to start writing some code to interact with that bucket, interact with our data. So I'm going to show you three different ways we can do that with Couchbase. So the first way is probably the most common. You've seen this before with other NoSQL databases. My beautiful hand-drawn picture here. Um, you, you have a key to the documents, and the documents are stored in Couchbase with a key. So each document has a unique key in a bucket. And you say, OK, give me the document that matches key K2. And Couchbase will say, OK, here's document two for key two. And oftentimes, that operation is going to be, you're just going to RAM and getting something out of RAM. So it's going to be a very, very quick operation. Um, you can ask for a, a, you know, a, a collection of documents by their keys. This is a very, very fast operation. By far, the, the fastest thing you can do with Couchbase is, is key-based operations. Um, and then those reads and writes, like I said, they're distributed across the nodes relatively evenly. There's a hashing algorithm used to determine that. So that's great, but it's, you know, if that's good enough for you, then this is what you should be using. But sometimes you need to do a little more rich querying of those documents to say, oh, I want, you know, documents that match certain criteria. I want to get those returned. That's where MapReduce might come in. So you start with a collection of uh, documents. You want to map some fields on those documents. So I'm getting name and age. And then I want to reduce them to maybe just uh, the documents where the age is greater than 21. So that I, I write two functions, a map and a reduce. And in Couchbase's case, I'm writing those in JavaScript and storing them on the Couchbase cluster. And then I can execute those views by name in my, in my code to get a certain set of documents. So that's pretty common among NoSQL as well. You'll see a lot of MapReduce out there with uh, other Document databases. You have a question? Earlier you distinguished the document and the key value pairs. I thought documents were a set of key value pairs. Yes. Yeah, so earlier I said key value pairs. Uh, in, in, that, in the sense of that, it's where the value itself can be any piece of data, not just JSON. It could be XML, binary, string, whatever. Um, but if we use JSON, we can do some more powerful things, like this MapReduce, where we can look at you know, fields and properties of a document. Uh, that's my sister's name, actually. Yeah. Interesting guess. Question over here? Uh, MongoDB lets you have documents, they call them documents, where they have more than the JSON data types. Right. So, so Mongo has the, uh, the Bison uh, data types, so some proprietary stuff in there. With Couchbase, it's just pure JSON. Was there another question over here? Um, oh, good question. I didn't think about it, actually. I was, I was thinking it was just a, a field in there, a raw field storing age, but it could actually be calculated as well. You, you could calculate that in your map function, for instance. So if, if I wanted that to basically, if I wanted to be able to run a complex query that involved that static value, um, but did not want to write, say, you know, two, two, two functions, yeah. right? Uh, could I build an index? That would, like, would that get me out of writing two functions, or would I always have to write two functions? So, um, so the question is, if I wanted to do this without having to write two functions, could I create an index? Um, I'm going to uh, answer your question by going to the next slide and saying you can use SQL to query, and, and this SQL is going to be using indexes to do that. Um, so Couchbase has a SQL implementation that we call Nickel. Uh, it's a superset of SQL because it's basically SQL for JSON. You know, a, a typical SQL database has tables and columns. A NoSQL database has JSON with arrays and objects and hierarchies in them that we need some additional functionality for. But I can also just write really simple, dirt simple uh, SQL here and say select from bucket where age is greater than 21. Couchbase will go and process it and give me back those results. Yeah, over the green. Yep. Do you have something like that? And, you know, or do you just have to always do 
the table scan. And the second yeah. one is if you have all these things in a cluster, you have to scan everything in every cluster location everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So well, the first question was <laughs> if um, <laughs> if I'm right in SQL, I typically put an index on age mm -hmm. for for this, and that way I wouldn't have to scan the entire table. And the answer is yes. You definitely want to create an index. Um, you can set up what's called a, a primary key index on buckets, which would be equivalent to a table scan. Um, but buckets can get very, very large, and that's not going to give you the good, very good performance. So you definitely recommend doing some good indexing on that. The second question was, does it have to scan across the entire cluster? Uh, and the answer is, of course it does, uh, because those documents are spread out across the cluster. So there is, uh, if you look into more detail, it's like a scatter gather type of algorithm that the uh, query engine uses to get those documents in place. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're here. So I guess inside the cluster, you have eventual consistency on the data. So potentially your index tables would be eventually consistent as well, or they uh, local to a particular machine in the cluster. Okay. So the question was about eventual consistency with indexes. Yeah. And uh, so the in, the indexing when you create a, a new document or update a document, and it needs to be indexed, that indexing will take place in the background as a background process. So hypothetically, unless you specify otherwise, your query might not return that document because it hasn't been indexed yet. So there are some options to deal with that if you want to guarantee that it gets returned. But of course, that affects your performance. So, uh, and the other, uh, was there another question? Or is that, does that answer your question? Yes. I can't remember now. <laughs> was one over here? So many questions. Yeah. Uh, are you converting this to the previous slide, the statement, or are you just running this as a native in one QL? So the, so the question was, is this being converted to a MapReduce query? The answer is no. There's two different sort of uh, ways to query, and they're, and they're separate. One doesn't convert into the other. So they, they sort of live side by side. So you can do nickel queries, or you can do MapReduce, or you can do both. It's going to be up to you. Over there, yeah. Uh, all right, last That's okay. Last next question, all right. <laughs> Oh, so the question was, if you're using solar, and can you share indices between Couchbase and solar? I have no idea answered that question. I can, I I can certainly find out. So, and In fact, let me write some of these things down, because some of these are, are good blog post ideas. Um, I like to steal from really good questions. So I don't know the answer at all, so I'll write it down and write a blog post. So solar shared indexes. Your Mac has a little note. <laughs> oh, is that how it's going to be? All right. <laughs> uh, one more thing I should mention is that uh, there are ODBC and JDBC drivers available. I wouldn't recommend them when you're writing your app, but if you're integrating with some other existing tool like Crystal Reports or whatever, you can connect ODB, uh, ODBC drivers to this, and it will convert them into Nickel for you. So it's a pretty cool thing. Okay. Uh, moving on here, we're going to start looking at some code now. And uh, there's a uh, SDK available for Node. It uses, it's uh, for Couchbase. And it uses just a wrapper for the C library, which is, I think, pretty common in Node libraries. As I said before, compatible with a lot of frameworks. I'm using Express tonight, but Sales and other ones will work just fine, too. Available on NPM and probably all the other thousand of other libraries or um, package managers that are coming out these days. Uh, here's some snippets on how you'd interact with that SDK. Uh, you just require the, the Couchbase dependency there. You want to create a cluster object by saying couchbase.cluster, and you give it one or more URIs where your nodes are. I only have one node running locally, but in production you might have, you know, dozens or, excuse me, hundreds of nodes. So you probably want to list those out there if you can, just in case one of them goes down and you need to reconnect for some reason. So once you have a cluster, then you can get access to what's called a bucket in Couchbase. And a bucket is just a collection of documents. And the keys in that bucket must be unique. Uh, the rule of thumb is a, you, for a t one application, you probably want to have one bucket. It's not required. You can have multiple if you want to. But that's roughly how you should think of a bucket as, as, as that sort of scope in terms of documents. Um, and then to execute some nickel, we'll say, you know, couchbase.nickel query, 
and we'll start specifying the actual uh, nickel there and parameters. We'll see more of that later. To create and save a document, I can just new up an object here and insert it with whatever key I want to. Uh, I'm going to be using new UIDs later, but you can use a string or number or whatever you want to. And there's a, a callback for that as well. Um, so uh, these are typically, uh, this cluster I think is typically a singleton, is that right? Yeah, cluster in the bucket are typically singletons in your, in your app. So here, oh, so here is a uh, sort of a helper method just to you know, get you a little uh, more comfortable with uh, the SDK. So this is, let's go through this line by line. We're going to create a function that takes in some SQL string or nickel string and has a, a done callback. All right, then we will, we can't just pass a string directly to Couchbase. We have to actually create a query object. So we'll say my query from string, and that takes the, the string, gives us a query to run. And then with the bucket, I'll say, okay, dot query, this query, and then there's a callback to handle uh, the, the result, the, the error or the result. And then in the callback, we can say if there's an error, you know, do something about it. In this case, I'm just logging it to the console. Uh, and then calling the, the done callback and passing the error to that. Otherwise, uh, successful and return the successful result. And that's it. So, uh, is that pretty, are you guys pretty comfortable with that? I don't know, like, uh, how comfortable people are with, uh, with Node, generally speaking. I'm, like I said, more of a Microsoft guy, so if this is uh, pretty um, straightforward to you guys, then that's good. Yeah, oh, I understand, I understand. So, I, I just... I don't know much about the Node uh, community, so. I did have one probably inappropriate question. You have an inappropriate question. All right, stand by, everybody. Well, it's going to turn into something else. But you mentioned something earlier about one bucket per application. Yeah. Is that advocating like domain logic applications, or are you talking monolithic style applications? Like microservices is kind of the new hotness, right? So yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying is um, microservice or are you actually like talking about so, Yeah, so the question was about microservices. So in the case of microservices, you probably, you have, you know, each might be a different application, right, technically speaking. In that case, uh, you probably don't want to have one bucket for each one of those if they're all operating on the, on the same sort of shared data set. So in that case, because basically there's a, there's a, a limit when it comes to buckets. Not a, not a hard limit, but once you get more than you know four or five buckets in your cluster, you're going to start to really run up against some uh, resource constraints in terms of memory and disk space, things like that. So buckets are meant to be very large. They're not meant to be small logical units, um, like a like a collection in Mongo or something, for instance. So, say it again. The buckets are heterogeneous. Yes. Yes. So they're meant to be very, very large. So you're not meant to have a bunch of them on a cluster, is what I'm saying. Okay, yeah. Yes, the documents don't have to be the same schema structure. It's all the documents, yeah. It's not like documents and screens and blogs and stuff. I mean, you can, I mean, generally you'd be storing all documents. You could store blobs and binaries in there if you wanted to. Like I said before, Couchbase can act as a key value store. Yeah. This question over there. Yeah, um, uh, I've used your uh, database before. Okay. And Great, thank you. And uh, there was this problem that I was bringing my other report. Okay. If you have uh, multiple collections right in the bucket and you want to insert into one and then uh, insert into a second one once yeah. the first one is complete, so you put that into uh, the, the callback function, right? So to insert. Okay. Uh, what I ran into was. Uh, would be really helpful to get the ID that I insert from the previous insert, so I can take that ID and shove it to the second type of uh, option. Okay. And usually I would get that from the result uh, in Mongo, so I'd yeah. be able to get the ID, but in, in Couchbase I was not able to find that ID, so I took the uh, take another method too. Yeah, so, so the question was basically, it would be nice if the, if the result returned the ID of the document I'm inserting. And, you know, I... 
I think it does that. I think it returns the ID. But in, in many cases, when you're inserting, you have to specify a key already. So it's not auto-generated or anything. So I know it might be convenient in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. Ottoman, Ottoman would do it. Yeah. Right. One more question over there. Yeah. Uh huh. Would that mean uh, like duplicated service layers? So the question was if if, a, if it was a multi-tenant app, but uh, they're still they're still in the same bucket, right? Well, the, the, the tenants are sharing a bucket. Separate buckets, but shared code, right? And, and, I see. And like a shared service layer. Yeah, I see. Um, that's a really good question. I don't have a good recommendation for you on that. I, I think we do have some multi-tenant customers, so I don't know the details of, of how they do that. Um, but th so the thing is, you, you, if you have a lot of tenants, one bucket per tenant is just not tenable. Um, one cluster per tenant might make more sense, but that's oh, probably right, a... Yeah. So assume multi-cluster, right? Okay. So one, you have a separate cluster per yeah. tenant, so all, all data is isolated, right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, I think that's totally possible. Uh, are you probably, well, let me think about that. That might be tricky because you'd have to have, hmm. Well, in, the, in that case, it was a singleton. So, but that's what I'm getting at is it wouldn't, it couldn't be a singleton in that case, right? So, um, yeah, that might be a, one way to manage it. You'd have uh, just a collection because uh, you don't want to be too chatty and be opening and closing those, um, those bucket objects, those cluster objects a lot. So yeah, that's a, that's really good. That might be another good blog post. Okay. All right. So I want to show you a quick demo of a very simple CRUD app here on this uh, this filthy Windows machine. So here I've got a PowerShell open here. If, I don't know if you guys can read that, but um, I'm just saying node app.js. I've got the full source code here. I'll give you the link to it on GitHub. But let's fire up this app here. And a port 3000, so I bring up the, uh, the app here. Uh-oh, my wireless go down again? Is that what happened? Uh, I asked for a two-day lease. <laughs> uh, let's see, connect again. What was the question? Uh, no, what you're seeing here is the fact that I used a CDN for Bootstrap. And uh, I, I didn't realize I was using CDN for Bootstrap. There we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a very, very simple CRUD app. I just have uh, a, a collection of persons. So I've got one in there already for myself. I'll just do a new one here. And I'll say uh, Austin Node.js and Austin at Node.js.edu. Uh, Save. So I've just created another document there. And I can go in and edit and make this make my name more exciting. There's an edit. All right. And then I'll hit a delete. And because I'm lazy, I didn't do a confirmation dialog, so it just deletes it. All right. And if I go over to my Couchbase console, which I'm trying to, here we go. And I, I'm using the default data bucket for that CRUD example. If I go in there and hit documents, you'll see that there's one document in there. This is the key, which is just a UUID. And this is the document itself, which is uh, some plain JSON, some very simple JSON, uh, pretty much what you'd expect. Now, we've got this type field in here. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. Um, that's not required. There's nothing magical about that. It's just another field that I put in that, uh, in that document. All right. Uh, so while we're here, let me just do a quick overview of this uh, console. So here's in my entire cluster. This is the, the RAM and the disk overview and then operations overview, uh, just a list of the servers there. If I hit server nodes, you'll see my whole list of nodes would be here if I had more than one, you know, its status and uh, RAM usage and so on. This is actually running in Docker on Windows, so don't panic when you see this RAM usage because I only have like one gig allocated, allocated here. So, And then here's the rebalancing stuff I was talking about. If you add new nodes to this, you'd have to then run a rebalance to 
redistribute the underlying um, data structures there across all those nodes. Uh, or if nodes go down, same thing, vice versa. So, uh, so the question was, does the rebalance do locks? Uh, no. So the rebalance is an operation that will take place in the background. So you can still, you know, your, your other nodes are operational until the rebalance is complete. So it'll, it'll prioritize pre-balance. It'll pri prioritize, yeah, your operational traffic. Yes, absolutely. Question over there? Okay. How do you, uh, or how does Couchbase uh, utilize RAM for that kind of stuff? Right. So uh, the question was, how does Couchbase utilize RAM? And when you set up a bucket in Couchbase, maybe I can just do this real quick. Let me give you the dialogue here. I can, I can type in a, a name. No, it has to be no spaces. And then I can say, how much RAM do I want to give per node to this bucket? All right. So. Uh, I only have, uh, for the whole cluster, I've allocated uh, half, half a gig, actually, to this cluster. I think the Docker container has one gig, so I've allocated half of that to this cluster. And then to the bucket itself, I can allocate some you know, other amounts in there. I think a minimum of 100, something like that. Yeah. So it won't use more than that RAM for that bucket, and then for the cluster, there's a larger quota there. So you can specify a, a cap on that. So the question was about an update. So if you're updating a single document, or insert, or, or, an, or insert, yeah, right, right. Is it bucket level locking, or is it, uh, uh, it did, locking? Right. So uh, it will. Um, so it, there's optimistic concurrency on this. So if you're trying to do an update, you can specify what's called a CAS value, and if that CAS value is the same, it's going to go ahead and perform it. If the CAS value is out of date, it'll give you a chance to say, okay, we'll we'll retry it because someone else has gone in and changed the document in the meantime, right? So there's that in terms of individual documents. In terms of multiple documents, there's no concept of transactions. Just like a lot of NoSQL databases, you can't you know, roll back from inserting multiple documents or deleting multiple documents, things like that. Uh, is the CAS value predetermined? So when you get a, a document, it'll give you some CAS value, it's just a number. And it, you can use that to compare when you're reinserting the document. So. Right. So, so the question was, if you do an update, does it replace the whole document? Excuse me. So, um, yes and no. You can, you can update the whole document if you want to. Couchbase 4.5 introduced this notion of sub documents, so you can update just a portion of the document. So you don't. So if you have a really large document. You just want to change one field. No sense replacing the whole darn document just for one field. So. so to this point, is that explicitly managed or is that managed within? Yeah, that's explicitly managed. So you have to say update this portion of the document or update the whole document. What I'm showing you tonight is, is the whole document. I'm not doing any sub-document stuff tonight. That, that API is available, though. OK. Um, I'm going to go back to the slides here. Okay, so um, we call it the Keen stack because we like to put our own letter instead of uh, an M up there for the mean stack, uh, which works out nicely. It's a nice little neat acronym. We don't have these cool acronyms in Windows world, sadly. Um, but anyway, that's so we're calling it the Keen stack. Or maybe the Ocean stack. If you use Ottoman, you put O up there, it'd be Ocean. Um, the stack design, which I alluded to in the beginning, it's, it's very, you know, you have this client front end. This is where all your HTML, JavaScript, CSS lives, your, your, your Angular templates. Um, and then the, the back end is just returning JSON uh, from, from the server there. So the only thing that couples them together is that definition of, of the REST API. So hypothetically, you could switch this for a React front end or a backbone or whatever. It's not very realistic, but you can also instead we use that API across multiple applications. So yeah, a web app, a mobile app, and maybe a, a desktop app of some sort. 
So that way, if you make a purchase over here, it will show up on your other app over there. Okay. So I am going to be showing you Angular 2 tonight. Hopefully you're not disappointed and want to see Angular 1. I do have some Angular 1 slides. If you, I can pull them out of storage if you really want to see them. Um, I'm just going to sort of scratch the surface of Angular 2. Um, uh, Angular 2 uses TypeScript. So if you guys are familiar, that's a, a sort of a superset of JavaScript that gets uh, transpiled down into JavaScript. It's a Microsoft thing, Microsoft and uh, Google joint effort sort of thing, I guess, with Angular 2. And so this is a component. And you can see the TS for TypeScript up there. Component roughly corresponds to like a, a UI component, or in my case, uh, like a whole sort of a logical page in this application. You can think of it like that. I have this array of people objects, which I've typed to any because I'm super lazy. I didn't want to create a people uh, interface. And this constructor just says we want to use the HTTP um, dependency to make our, our REST requests. And then uh, implementing on init so that when this component loads uh, and Angular initializes it, it's going to make a REST call to this endpoint, API get all, which will return all the persons in, uh, from that response, and then I'm going to map them to, uh, to JSON objects using that, and subscribe. Those results, if it's successful, will go to that people array, which at that point, Angular will say, hey, this changed. I'm going to update the, um, the HTML, which we'll see in a second. Well, if there's an error, I'm just going to write it to console. And optionally, you could do a complete in here, but I just omitted that. Uh, I've omitted a lot of stuff, actually. There's some boilerplate that's uh, I just omitted for clarity here. Uh, the source code is all available, so if you want to check it out, you can. Here's the corresponding HTML page with some Angular templates. There's a for loop that goes over all that, uh, that people object that I showed you in the last one and uh, writes it out to a table. And then I create an edit link and a delete link for each of those objects. So the edit's going to do a, a router and go to that, uh, that component, that item component there. And the delete is just going to trigger this delete method, which I didn't show you in the code. I admitted that as well. OK? So that's, yeah? So the question was, is this an endpoint to the couch database? No, we're not, we're not going directly to couch base. This is, this is the uh, a node uh, running express. Well, that's hitting. So you don't want to interact directly with Couchbase from Angular. That would probably be, well, maybe a cores problem and a security problem sort of thing. So we're going to a back end. So if I want to now create or edit a person, here is the template you'd see for that. It's pretty much HTML with the exception of I'm binding to the person object with ng model over there. And uh, this button here cancels by just going back to the home page. And this button here will go to, it will call the save method in my component, which I haven't showed you yet, but that's sort of the, the basic form that you'd see uh, that Angular is going to generate and bind to that component there. Okay? And then here's the corresponding uh, components for that. Uh, it also uh, has, the, well, it has this person object instead of an array, because we're just dealing with one person now. And when I hit that, well, that button to save, it's going to, uh, let's see here. We're going to post to this endpoint, the API save endpoint. We're going to just pass a, a, a JSON string of that person with those options, because I want to I want to post JSON in this case to my endpoint. Question over there. So you didn't make a person object, but there does seem to be that there could be a very natural mapping between JavaScript object and the JSON document, right? Could it trivially make So the question was, I, I didn't make a person object. Uh, I mean, this up here is what I'm, do you mean like a type? Yeah. A person type? Yeah, I, I, could have, I could have done that for sure. Yeah. But I'm super lazy. You're something, but when I see people stringifying things, that means they are moving outside the type system. Okay. If you made a person object, the type system is supposed to make that easy for you. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to double check a lot. 
No, I mean, that, that, that's fair enough criticism, but I, you know, at some point I'm, I am posting to an endpoint, so that does have to be, you know, a, it's not, I can't post a type, I have to post a string to an endpoint, right? So, but yeah, that's, that's a fair point. I may, you know, maybe I want to change that stringify and, and maybe uh, put that inside the person type, for instance, and put, move that logic there. Maybe that's what you're getting at. It might make sense. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so then this is just going to get some results back. Um, I don't really, I'm sort of ignoring those results, but I'm going back a page to the, to the list. Oh, if, unless there's an error, I'll write it to console. Okay. All right, so that's just my sort of scratch the surface of Angular 2. And uh, just want to see that all I'm doing is just interacting with those REST endpoints. Yeah, over here. Uh, am I getting a cursor back from this from the save here? Converting everything to JSON. Yeah. Uh, but so far, the entire conversation has been around how we're storing JSON. Yes. So why do we have to convert something already? Why do we have to con Because, like, what, what, what kind of class is HTTP that that's not part of any, any uh, couch? Excuse me. Yeah, no, this, yeah, this. It's not happening in this app. Right. right. Yeah, we're not actually storing here. This is the back end, and this. This is, oh, no, sorry, this is the front end, and it's posting to this back end here. Okay, so you're not using any, any client-side frameworks to serialize and serialize for you? Um, I mean, so Angular 2 does some, I mean, I think this right here is, is deserializing into JSON objects. If you go back to this example here, right here, this is giving me back a, a JSON string, essentially. And then this part here is going to map them into actual JSON objects. which I can then set to this variable. Okay. I mean, it's, Angular 2 has been changing like crazy, so. Say that again? Well, that's, that's, that's sort of the point, is HTTP, it's, it's a string. So we have to go from a string into, you know, something that JavaScript or TypeScript understands is an object. So there is that, I mean, that's just HTTP. I don't think we can get around that, so. Right, I get that. I was, uh, I'm just saying, okay, so HTTP is an Angular 2 component. Yes, yeah, this is an Angular 2 dependency. Right, that's coming in from right here, being injected. I didn't show that boilerplate code right. where that's coming in, but. No, no. We haven't actually seen anything Couchbase specific yet in Angular 2. So this could, this could work with a SQL backend or Mongo backend or whatever. Okay. All right, so let's look at the backend now, Node.js. So the most exciting part of any Node.js application is, of course, the config. Um, I've just created a config JSON file here. You don't have to do, you don't have to name it config, nothing special about that. but. This is where I'm just putting how to connect to Couchbase, where the Couchbase uh, cluster is, the name of the bucket I want to interact with. You can call a bucket whatever you want to. We saw that already. Uh, here is the app.js app file. This is the one I showed you I ran from PowerShell earlier. This is part of it anyway. There's more, there's more stuff in there. But this is where I'm saying, OK, I want a I, I dependency on Express. This body parser is because Express, I guess, can't handle posting of JSON by default. So I'm adding that in there. Uh, the Couchbase dependency um, path, this is for some, you know, if we want to interact with a file system and set up a, a path for static files. And the config file I just showed you. And then this is how I kick off Express. So anybody here use Express or familiar with Express? A lot of people. Okay, great, great, good. So um, here's sort of the rest of, of app.js and Express. Here's where I'm setting up that body parser to handle JSON. At this point, this is where I'm actually starting to connect to Couchbase. We saw this code earlier where I'm saying connect to the cluster and open a specific bucket. And then here's the static up, the path thing for a public folder. And then I have a routes.js file where my endpoints are. I haven't showed you that yet, but that's where the express endpoints are. And then kick off the server. OK. Well, nothing out of the ordinary there so far. So now I'll set up an endpoint here. And this is the create endpoint. So I want to post to this when I'm creating or editing an existing, or creating or editing a document. And it messed up my quotes over there. Darn it. Um, 
so this is just some really basic validation here to say that uh, you know first name must be you know you must pass in a first name and there's other ones in there for last name and email just some really basic uh, validation and then I'm going to go off and use this record model that which I haven't shown you yet but there's another class that I'm going to pass I'm going to call the save method and pass in the body of the of the post to that method and then there's a callback to handle errors or um, or just a successful result and uh, send that off. Okay? So very, very thin, very, you know, not much going on in these endpoints. Just they're acting as traffic cops, getting the request, sending it off to some model and returning the results. Uh, here's another one. This is for the git. I want to git an individual document by an ID. So same sort of thing, really dumb validation here. And then call the git by document ID method of record model. Right, and I messed up my quotes over there, too. Ah, <laughs> stupid PowerPoint. Uh, and then hopefully you're seeing a pattern here. Here's a delete endpoint. Now, I'm using post in this case. You could use delete verb if you want to be more semantically correct. That would be fine, too. Uh, validation, and then delegate to the delete method of record model. All right. Uh, one thing to note with the, or with, um, I wouldn't know. We'll talk about it later. Okay. So now let's look at record model. So this is a uh, another uh, object called record model, and I'm defining the save method on that object. And this takes in the, the data, and then I have a callback as well. And I'm going to just map a new JSON object here. Now I could pass data in directly if I wanted to, but I'm just trying to be a little more explicit about what I'm actually mapping from that data object to the object I'm going to eventually store. This is, this is optional. You could just pass data directly in. I'm also adding this type user on there because when I'm storing this document, I want to, because we're in a heterogeneous collection of documents, I want to be able to set them apart somehow. So user documents are separate from invoice documents, et cetera. So the way I'm choosing to do that in this case is by creating a sort of a magic field here called type, and it has a value of user. That's not the only strategy for that, but that's, that's one that's very popular. And I think Ottoman uses that strategy as well. And then down here, I'm just going to, because this method is handling both adds and edits, I want to check to see if a document ID is being passed in. If it is, then we're editing something, or we're making a change to a document. Otherwise, I want to generate a new UUID and uh, pass it in as my key. So now I'm using this, which actually this should be bucket, I think, not DB. Is that what I called it earlier? Uh, the module, yeah, I call it a bucket. Yeah, okay, well, I don't know why it's DB over here and bucket over there, but this will be a bucket. I'm going to say upsert. Upsert is kind of like a merge. It's either going to update or insert, depending on if that key already exists in your bucket or not. And so this is the key, and then this is the object I'm passing in, and there's the callback. And we'll call back with a uh, success. And uh, in this case, I guess I'm also passing back the uh, result. Okay. Over there, all the way back. You, you mentioned that we have to generate the user explicitly. And can we, can we make sure that uh, this UUID is unique across the cluster? So the question was, can we make sure this UUID is unique across the cluster? I think mathematically, I can't guarantee that. But I think you will probably live longer than uh, will required to get a collision in UUIDs. Can't you ask Couchbase to do that for you? Couchbase will not auto-generate keys for you. OK, well, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I, I would be happy to uh, be proven wrong about that. But as far as I know, you have to specify the key when you create a document. I know Couchbase Lite automatically generates keys. I know that for sure. Um, why, what would be the case? Um, I, I can't think of a reason. So, I mean, that, you know, he may be absolutely right. It may be able to generate keys. And I've just been wrong this whole time. So. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I guess the only reason I, th I can think of as a designer reason is that we don't want to impose a, a specific type of key on you. 
you know, we don't want to say UUIDs are the keys. You can specify, a, you know, a composite key or a number or uh, whatever you want to as a key. So that may be a reason why we make that decision. Okay, and uh, so we showed this. I'll show this already, but here's what the document looked like. Here's the UUID. Here's the very simple flat JSON object there. That's the document view in Couchbase server. Okay. So the question was, is the key stored as part of the object? You mean like if I wanted it down in here? Uh, uh, so in, in MongoDB, it kind of is, right? It's a special name, right? Underscore ID. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I don't. It's not something that's stored as part of the document itself. It's it's considered the metadata of the document. And actually, the next slide is going to kind of demonstrate that some more. So here, if I want to create a method to get the document by an ID, and I'm passing the document ID there, I could construct a MQL query to select those fields from the given buckets, and I'm going to say where the metadata for each of those documents, and I want to check the ID, which is the key of the document, equals that parameter. All right. So I just pass that as a string to this, and you want to make sure you use parameterization because there can be SQL injection in a NoSQL database. I saw your hand up first. So the question was, can you do joins between, um, you can do joins within a bucket, you can do joins between a bucket. Okay. Yes. Over there was a question. Um, I guess, other than just using like regular route-based parameters, is there a way to make this less likely to be SQL injected? Yes. So, uh, well, I mean, so this is using uh, query parameterization right here, right? Oh. So this dollar sign one is being replaced with this document ID. Yeah, this is an array here. So you can do dollar sign one, dollar sign two, et cetera. Yeah. So definitely do that. Question right there. And uh, I guess I'm just curious because you're talking about nickel and is, is there any other way of getting information in and out of hash base? Or yes, that? yes. So, so nickel is a really cool query language and a lot of people are familiar with SQL, so it's a great introduction to it. Uh, I mentioned earlier you can do key-based operations to do inserts and, 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 uh, and, and gets, and also map reduces to do uh, sort of uh, more complex queries that way. Yeah. You can also do an insert with nickel if you wanted to go that route. Inserts, updates, deletes, those all work. Um, so yeah, this is the query itself. This is, these are the parameters. Now, I mentioned earlier that the key-based operations are the fastest way to operate a couch base. So don't actually do this. Uh, because this is only ever going to return zero or one uh, documents, right? Because we're, we're querying it by the ID. I'm just trying to sort of introduce nickel in just a, a little simple to read query. We'll get some more complex ones here if we have time. So normally I would just say db.get and then pass in the key, the document ID. But I'm just sort of demonstrating nickel there. So don't do literally this. Uh, here's the delete method, which is just db.remove with the key. Pretty straightforward there. Nothing crazy. Same pattern. Document ID. So, if we're doing okay on time, uh, I'll show you some more complex queries here. Maybe I won't do my normal spiel of running these in the uh, query uh, workbench. But here's an example where I want to find um, airports. I want to find two different airports, a from and a to. And this is just kind of to show off that, hey, we have unions here as well. Um, but basically, I'll pass in uh, two different airports, and these are the parameterized uh, um, parameters, <laughs> I guess, and they go into there. So I could say, uh, give me all the airports that are Columbus, give me all the airports that are Austin, and it would union them together and give me those two airports. So pretty cool to union. That's, that's an operation that's really tough to do in like a, a map reduce situation. Or in a in a get key situation, maybe not this specific one, but um, also I'm introducing this thing called the travel. Well, it's not on there, is it? Travel sample bucket. So when you install Couchbase server, you can install a sort of predefined sample data bucket called travel sample. There are a couple other ones as well. Um, so that comes with like 32,000 documents of of data that you can play with and and try out nickel and things like that. So sort of building the Couchbase there. 
Here's a more complicated example. We're showing off some joins now. So I'm getting uh, all the routes between two different cities um, for all the airports. And all those routes have an airline ID in them as a field. So it's like airline underscore one, two, three. But I want to actually get the airline name, like American Airlines or United or whatever. So I have to join to another document. So that's right here. I'm joining to the same bucket because they're all in the same bucket. But I'm aliasing it differently. And I'm saying, give me all those documents that correspond to the key that's in airline ID field. So I'll get back a single collection of JSON documents with that join. And I'm also showing an unnest here, which is also a type of join, but it's unique to JSON because you can have an array uh, in uh, a JSON object. So if you want to join to that array, the document itself can join to that array, and you'd end up with you know, a sort of flattened version of your JSON document, which might be useful for some situations. So if we have time, I can walk through this example step by step to show you uh, how this how that works but I want to make sure I get through all this here and don't keep you guys too long here are some samples so this is the one I've been showing you tonight restful angular js node.js that used to be an angular one repository so if you go back in the history you can see the angular one version but right now it's angular two and then this one up here is sort of an intro to node uh, with couchbase so you can go check those out if you're interested more in Nickel, here's an online interactive tutorial. You don't have to even install Couchbase. You can just go to this website and start playing with Nickel queries. I think some of them are disabled for security reasons. We don't want you messing up everything, but you can run most of the Nickel queries here online. Is, is there any feature disparity between Nickel and, and I guess, JavaScript queries? Any feature disparity between Nickel and like the MapReduce JavaScript stuff? Uh, I would say the nickel is probably a little more powerful. Like I showed you that union. I'm not sure how you would go about doing that in a MapReduce, a single MapReduce. Um, and the MapReduce, I don't think can do, and maybe it can, but I don't think it can do inserts, updates, deletes, things like that. So I think nickel is very, very powerful. That's sort of been a recent thing we've introduced to Couchbase Server as compared to MapReduce, which has been there for a while. Uh, someone mentioned Ottoman, I think, already. Um, so if you're used to relational databases, you have ORMs often, right? We don't have, it's not a relational database, so we have ODMs, uh, object uh, data models. And this one you can find on uh, NPM. Uh, it's just called Ottoman. Uh, get it, because like, uh, it's furniture. Couch base, Ottoman, right? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, if you used Mongo before, this is sort of the equivalent of Mongoose. And I think actually they're API compatible, so you could probably switch between them if you wanted to. So just to make, um, correct, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but this is an example of how you might want to use Ottoman. You can set up a new record model, call it record, and specify the types. You can even specify a default value for that. And then, then you have a record model you want to interact with that way. And so I could, for instance, say, give me a new record with uh, these values, and then you know, call dot .save on that record and, and handle the callbacks for that. So that might save you some boilerplate and there's some other functionality in there, like there's a find, for instance. Um, so you can specify, in this case, I'm just saying give me everything. But I can specify, you know, give me, put in basically like a query there in JSON format. And I think that gets translated into nickel behind the scenes. Excuse me. So you could do, a, you could use Ottoman to do a find. All right. Okay, so that's all I have on Couchbase Server. I wanted just a couple slides on Couchbase Mobile because it's a pretty cool little thing that we have. Uh, Couchbase Lite is an embedded NoSQL database. You can put it on your device, and it's an offline database, so you can read and write to it, even if you don't have a cellular connection. And uh, that's pretty cool. And then if, when you have a connection, if you want to, you can use Sync Gateway to sync up the data between this database, or this phone and other phones, and a, a Couchbase Server cluster. You can sync the data all around. So you can get an update, and then when you go back offline, you can read and write those records, and then come back online and, and synchronize. So that's pretty cool. Uh, by the way, this is all open source, if, you, if I didn't say that up front. Uh, Couchbase is an open source uh, tool, uh, including Couchbase Mobile and, and Sync Gateway. Here's an example of Couchbase Lite using native script. If you guys are familiar, that's a, 
a Telerik framework for writing mobile apps with uh, JavaScript. So that's pretty cool. Check out that example there. Uh, we have our conference coming up in the next month in Santa Clara, California. So I'm sure you guys are going to book your tickets right now to get out there. But if, if not, you can also uh, live stream the conference there if you sign up. Uh, or we'll post, uh, we'll send you recordings after the conference is over. So if you want to check out that content. These are the stickers that I have. Actually, I, I think I might have only like this one and this one left. So if you want a sticker, come up and ask me afterwards. And um, those who tweeted get priority. What's that? One of each. One of each? You only have one of each? No, no, no. I mean, I, this is, I have like a, maybe a dozen left. I have only these two kinds left. The, all the other ones were taken. So they were really greedy last night. I'm sorry for that. Uh, this is my family here. They're all a bunch of shrimps. Uh, this is where you can find us on uh, Couchbase, uh, our developer advocate team. We're also on Twitter. Uh, this is our, our group account. I'm on Twitter as M Groves. And if you, you know, if you have a question or comment or something about Couchbase, some feedback. If you guys try Couchbase tonight and you're like, oh, this is terrible because of this, this, and this, let me know. I, I want to know those things. That's sort of my job is to convey that to the product managers and to the developers and let them know that this is what's keeping people from from using Couchbase. Okay, so I've got time for, uh, do I have time for questions or anything else we want to go through? Yeah, so go right ahead, yeah. So for us little guys who are just uh, bootstrapping little startups here and there, yeah. do you have subscription plans that are low cost or no cost for to get in the door and start building with it? Uh, so uh, it is open source. Like I said, we have a free community edition of Couchbase server. Um, totally free to use in uh, production. LinkedIn, I believe, is using community edition. Um, they're not a small startup, but uh, they're using Community Edition in production right now. So it's, it's typically a release behind our Enterprise Edition. So you may have to wait longer for those newer features. And some features are Enterprise only. Some of the more you know, uh, advanced uh, edge case features so you might want. deploy that on Heroku or another service um, I don't know about Heroku, but you could deploy it to your own hardware. You could deploy it to AWS or Azure or uh, maybe even OpenStack, things like that. Yeah. Sure. And that goes for Couchbase Lite too. The community editions of that, they're all free for you to try out and deploy to production. <sighs> Do you have an image on Docker Hub? Do we have an image on Docker? Yes. There's a Docker. That's actually what I'm running on this local machine, is our, our latest Docker image, which is Enterprise Edition. Uh, by, the way, by the way, if, if you guys just want to try out the Enterprise Edition, some cool features in there, as long as you're not deploying to production, that's, that's totally fine. Just download it and try it out. Just don't deploy it to production um, because that, you need a license for that. But <laughs> if you want to try it out, go right ahead. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> All right, thank you, Matt. Oh, was there one more question? That's fine. Sure. Okay. Switch to Couchbase? Uh, uh, well, I mean, from, I guess would be the question, from something else, from Mongo. You know, I, I think um, you know, Mongo is a very popular tool and great community support, and I, I can't deny that. They're, they're the, the leaders right now in the document database. I think one of the things that Couchbase has is that cool um, memory caching feature, so you're going to get some really good performance from that. You can go check out some benchmarks on our site. If you want to learn, you know, dive into that in more detail. Um, you know, I think in terms of scaling, some people have run into issues with Mongo uh, to scale out uh, to a certain point, and, and Couchbase I think has has that uh, challenge pretty well in hand. So those might be a couple reasons you want to check it out. I would just encourage you to just for fun, just for curiosity, download it and try it out, and see what you think, and uh, and just maybe keep it in your back pocket for some future project. Maybe it'll be good for. Yeah. So I'll be around here as long as they'll you know, let me, as long as the, until they kick me out, answering questions, talking to you guys if you want to. Um, so thank you very much, um, thank you. Earl, and thank you everybody for coming. <laughs>